Hello, and welcome to Traditions of Grace. I'm Pastor Darren Vick, Senior Pastor at Community of Grace Lutheran Church, and I am so delighted you've chosen to join us for worship today. In just a moment, you will be experiencing a traditional worship service that includes elements from our pre-recorded worship services of the past, along with our most recent sermon from our current sermon series. It is my hope that you would know the love of Jesus and the presence of the Holy Spirit as we worship together. And now, welcome to worship. Would you please rise for our opening hymn? As we enter into this time of confession and forgiveness, we do so in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. According to 1 John chapter 1, it says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, 
God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And trusting in that promise, I ask now for a time of just some silent reflection. Most merciful God, we confess that without Christ, we are in bondage to sin, and we cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, sent Jesus to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all our sins. In the authority of Scripture and by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ, I tell you by his promise that what you have confessed has most surely been forgiven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The congregation may be seated. prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Hope is an incredible thing. 
The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13 that there are three things that will remain, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love, but that's not to put aside faith and hope. Hope is something that Minnesota Adult and Teen Challenge has been bringing to people for decades. Folks who are struggling with addiction, folks who need another chance to turn their lives around, but more importantly, to turn their lives over to Jesus and to let Jesus be the one who guides them and brings them into wholeness. And you're going to hear stories of hope that come our way. And it's so important that we share our stories of hope, regardless of our background, regardless of what we've been through. To be able to share hope with someone else is a powerful gift, something that every one of us should be able to share with others. The hope of Jesus, Jesus who is our living hope, that's the hope that we want to bring to people. Because every other kind of hope, it fades. It fades away pretty quickly. You know, I can hope that the twins are going to play some baseball this summer and that I'm going to get a chance to see them. Um, I can hope that maybe the basketball season will get back underway again or the hockey season or maybe football will return this fall or maybe I'll get a chance to see my son in his marching band for his senior year his last time. Those are all things that I hope for. But my ultimate hope is not in those things. My ultimate hope is in the living hope given to us through Jesus. That's the hope that we need. It's the hope that everyone needs. So we're going to listen to some stories of hope. We're going to hear from Mark Bergren, as I mentioned before, who uh, works with the church relations team over at Minnesota Adult and Teen Challenge. He's got some words of encouragement to us, to thank us and to encourage us to continue to be partners with Minnesota Adult and Teen Challenge. Then we're going to hear a powerful testimony, a story of hope, someone who is ready to, to share their reason for the hope that is within them. And then we're going to come back around here to hear from one of our own, Laura Holmberg, who is going to share with us her story of hope and how God has been at work in her life in such powerful ways. So friends, let's continue our journey together with Minnesota Adult and Teen Challenge. And I want to say one more time to those of you from Minnesota Adult and Teen Challenge who are watching, we love you. We are so thankful to be partnered with you. And we ask that you would be praying for us. We know there's a lot of things that are going on in our world today, and, uh, and our church is one small part of that. But we appreciate your prayers. We know you are a people of faith. So would you be praying for us as we're walking this journey of faith and trying to bring hope to others as well? We would certainly appreciate that. Well, God bless you, and now let's hear from Mark. Hello, Community of Grace Church. My name is Mark Bergren. I work on the church relations team over at Minnesota Adult and Teen Challenge. God bless you guys. Hope you are doing well. Hope you are safe. Uh, wanted to send a quick video to make sure you guys were updated on what we've been up to. Um, first off, thank you so much for hosting us year in, year out, you guys continue to lean into our needs, uh, providing us with mentors and, and volunteers, as well as creating an awesome Sunday experience every time uh, two of our choirs come for both of our, ser our services with you guys uh, that are happening simultaneously. You guys take care of both groups so well. They get a, a nice breakfast right when they get there, and uh, they feel filled with love and joy and acceptance from the body of Christ. Uh, and so thank you so much for being an example to our clients. And that didn't stop this year. Uh, just because we aren't able to join you guys live because of COVID, you guys still are sending us bagels, and, and uh, our guys right now are even tuning in. So hello, Portland House. Hello, Hudson House. God bless you guys as you tune in uh, to Community of Grace Church this morning. Wanted to give you a quick update. We're still open. Our services are, are still helping those in need, um, and our doors are still open. Uh, so across the state, up in Brainerd, Duluth, Rochester, uh, our teen boys facility out in Buffalo, Minnesota, and, uh, and of course, all around Minneapolis, uh, we are still taking care of people who have been hurt by drugs and alcohol. And... Uh, and so if you or someone you know is struggling with an addiction from Community of Grace or around your area, we want to be a resource for you. And so give us a call, 612-FREEDOM, or visit us online, mntc.org. If you guys want to support us this year, please be praying. Be praying for people, even right now, who are out in isolation. We know addiction increases in isolation and uh, and so be praying for those people who are still hurting but be also in prayer for our clients uh, and their families 
Uh, it is a discouraging time, but we pray that the testimonies continue to happen. Uh, one after another, continue to come in and find hope and find healing and si find satisfaction in Christ Jesus. Uh, so be praying for us uh, as we continue to expand and uh, all of our services continue to help Minnesota out in this time. And then finally, if you want to financially give to Minnesota Adult and Teen Challenge in this time, we've made a really easy way. It's a text to give campaign. You text the word HOPE, H-O-P-E. Text the word HOPE to 900-900. That's text the word HOPE to 900-900. A link will be sent to you in response. And uh, you click on that and you'll be led to our website. And it's, uh, it's a really easy way for you guys to give and team up with us financially in this time when we're not able to do in-person uh, fundraising events right now. So thank you. If you can give a little, please do. If you can give a lot, uh, please give a lot. And, uh, and God bless you guys. Thank you for your continual support. Uh, thank you so much for taking care of the people who are hurting uh, from a chemical addiction. And, uh, and God bless you guys and stay safe. After so many years of being lost in that wilderness of feeling there was, there was no way out and I was simply going to die in this addiction. Everything you're trying to find to save you can't do it. And you're just in this vast emptiness. My parents had me when they were really young and to support his family my dad decided to join the military and that was hard on me. Um, it meant moving around a lot. By the time I was 12, I was smoking weed. Um, shortly after that, it was cocaine, LSD, mushrooms, pretty much anything I could get my hands on. And then I found methamphetamines, and I thought I had found everything that I was looking for, but it slowly took everything away from me. Two months after I graduated college, I was arrested with five ounces of methamphetamine 38 pills of ecstasy and a loaded 380 handgun, and I was on my way to prison for five years. I remember my first visit when my mom and dad came to see me. And when my mom walked into that visiting room and I saw her just shaking with my dad's arms around her, trying to walk her up to see me, I felt like the lowest thing on this planet to know that I had done that to my mom. That's when it really hit me that meth had stolen everything from me. I didn't grow up wanting to be a drug dealer or an addict. I grew up wanting to be a doctor and I thought my whole life was gone when I heard that cell door slam. Um, but I did my time. I got out and things were going well for the most part. But then in 2008, the economy fell apart and I was looking at losing everything and I turned back to the thing that I thought loved me. I, I ran back to meth. And the next three years of my life were filled with homelessness, being suicidal. 2012, I don't even remember sending the text message, but it simply said, Mom, I can't do this anymore. I'm ready to go home and be with Jesus. And I would get my prayers answered, just not in the way that I thought I would. It came in the form of handcuffs again. And I was sitting in jail and looking at going back to prison. I walked into that courtroom and there was my mom smiling at me. And I barely spoken to her outside of that text message and a couple of phone calls begging for help from jail. But nonetheless, she showed up still to support me. The judge had been speaking to her and he called us both in front of him and he told me the story of his daughter who had died in his arms of a heroin overdose about a year before. And he had every right 
to hate people like me. I'm part of the problem. I mean, he, he should have sent me away for a long time, but he didn't. He looked at me with compassion. He said, young man, I'm gonna give you a chance. I'm gonna let you go to Teen Challenge. Don't you make your mother cry the way my, the way my daughter did to me. And those words stuck with me. And I got my chance and I walked through the doors of Teen Challenge and for the first time in my life, I felt I had hope. I walked in the doors with nothing but a raggedy t-shirt and a torn up pair of sweatpants. And by the end of the day, my closet had everything I could need. I had guys stopping by my room saying, hey brother, welcome to Teen Challenge. Can we pray with you? I got to start working on all the issues behind my addiction. My need to work on integrity and humility and, and Minnesota Adult Teen Challenge offers everything from, from mental health help to one-on-one -on -one counselors to being able to sit down and discuss things with your chaplain to digging into all the different contracts we have that deal with grief and loss and, and forgiveness and humility and integrity. And it was in that that I finally began to figure out who I was, that I was a child of God. I graduated the program. I went through the TCLI Leadership Institute it was so nice to be able to leave the program and know that my care didn't end there. That we have alumni events and weekly things that you can come back to and be a part of. And if you're struggling, there's a network that you can reach out to and be able to say, you know, I, I, I need help. I got a job where I was working down at the new Rochester Center and I'm now celebrating seven and a half years of sobriety. <laughs> and my beautiful wife and I just got to celebrate three years of marriage. You know, this program saved her life too. She now has six years sober herself. Years and years of addiction in our family is gonna end with us. Every day, we're pulling men and women out of the wasteland of addiction and putting them on a path to recovery. People like Matt come to Teen Challenge where we're able to put them on the path of life, following faith, and also doing the hard work of dealing with the issues inside of them. And then there's family restoration. Family restoration based on love and grace. You are literally walking with us hand in hand to that wasteland to helping people get on the path of true life. Thank you. You are making a huge difference in people's lives and we couldn't do this without you. People that support Minnesota Adult and Teen Challenge mean everything to me and to us. This program wouldn't exist without them, and this program saved my life. Thinking about how blessed I am, I'm thinking I've lived more in the last seven and a half years and the whole 32 years of my life before that combined. I wake up every day wanting to go and help people and getting to see miracles happen every day like the miracle that happened to me. We were made for all of this. You alone, my confidence. Ready for it all. This is who we are, and this is where it starts. Wow. What a powerful testimony. Thank you, Matt, for sharing your story. You know, we uh, we make it a point. We we when we partner with. Uh, Teen Challenge, and we want to make it a point to let our congregation know that addiction is not just something that happens in the city. It's not just something that's localized to a certain place, but it happens everywhere, including in the suburbs, including here in our home church. And the good news and the grace in Jesus is that recovery also happens. And so we want to celebrate a story of recovery today. And we've got uh, one of my friends, one of our very special congregation members who's just amazing and lights up the room. Laura Holmberg is here. Hi, Laura. Good morning. Oh my gosh, we're just, uh, we w I wanted to bring you in here because I thought, who can, who can talk about recovery and Jesus so well? <laughs> it was you. So just got some questions for you that we want to go through. And if, if you feel like you need to say something that's not on the script or not directly answer the question, just go for it. You have that freedom, all right? All right. All right so um, first, how long have you been a member here at Community of Grace? 
Um, it's been 2012, no, yeah, 2012 when I walked through the doors and kind of stayed. I, you know, I, I did leave one time, and I've learned since that it's because God wasn't quite ready, or I wasn't quite ready. God had a lot left to teach me, and it was about addiction. Wow. All right. Um, this week, we talked on the phone, and you were telling me you just celebrated an anniversary. Can you talk about that? Yes, I celebrated six years on Monday. So it was, uh, it's, it's been an amazing journey, but it was all because of God. I, I didn't do it. I just didn't do it. I couldn't. Yeah, so six years sobriety? Six years of sobriety. Wow. Yeah, six years. It would have been eight had I relied on Christ in the very beginning. But instead, I tried to rely on my own strength, which wasn't enough. Well, I think it's, it's just appropriate to ask, you know, tell us your story. Tell us a little bit of it and uh, just know that there are people out there watching who um, can benefit from this for sure. Um, well, I, I s realized probably a little over eight years ago that I had a problem. My family decided that it was time to do a little tough love. So it, it worked for a little while um, until I started relapsing again. I continued to lie. I continued to be the person that looked like they were safe in recovery. Um, and then finally, six years ago, I finally just relied on strength outside my own. Um, you know, I, I was so tired of making excuses, but I didn't have the strength on my own to quit making those excuses. So I finally fell to my knees and I won't get into everything that led me to that point. And when I did that, it was like the compulsion to drink was lifted. I could never understand how someone, when they introduce them in the rooms of AA, we say, hi, my name's Laura, and I'm an alcoholic. And I never could understand how someone would say, I'm a grateful alcoholic. And I thought, I'm not grateful to be an alcoholic. But what I found is, I am grateful for the path that God put in front of me. I struggled trying to use my own strength. And they, they, there's one saying that always resonated with me. When you finally become strong enough and have the strength to quit making excuses for your behavior. But what I found is that that strength does not resonate in me as a human being. I could only lean on Jesus to give me the strength I needed. So I started going to meetings. I went to outpatient treatment. I had tried two other times to get sober. Um, but this time, I actually worked the program. And where I went, God was part of that program. And he became my biggest cheerleader and my true story, which lies in just the cleansing that the Holy Spirit can have if you allow him in and you lean into him instead of your own devices. So it's been an interesting journey. I've had some really hard things happen, but I didn't have to drink. I was, I, I've leaned onto my church family. I've leaned into my AA meetings. I'm blessed enough to have a sponsor who is a Christian, and right now she's going through some tough things and not able to talk with me all the time. So I went back to my counselor um, where I went to outpatient treatment, who is also a Christian. And you, you have to get to a point where you're finally ready to ask for help. And that help for me first came from Jesus. And Jesus led me to other ways that help was out there for me. Um, right now, especially with the, the way life is right now, it's hard, and it's hard to get newly sober when we can't meet together. It's just not the same. Um, yeah, that's, I, that's definitely a great question. You know, what is recovery like in a pandemic? What is, because this changes everything. It changes the social dynamic. It changes the opportunities to meet together. Uh, I know mental illness, depression, those increase are running rampant right now. So how... What words do you have for people who are going through recovery in this time? I think the biggest thing is, you know, when I first got sober, I had so many face-to-face -face meetings with people, and now we have Zoom meetings. If you're struggling and you want help, go to the AA. Just 
type in AA in your Google search and you will find a wealth of things to help. It is hard when we can't meet face to face, but now some things are being lifted and we can, group, we can meet in groups less than 10 people and practice our social distancing. Um, call people, just, you, you just have to reach out and call. And above all, just pray. Um, the strength is there, it's just not within ourselves until we ask for that help. Now, I know you're a huge proponent of groups. Um, just what's, how are groups so helpful? And why is it that people have to do this? It just seems like people in recovery are infinitely more successful in groups and in relationship than on their own. Can you just talk about that a little? Well, you know, you might, people might feel that they totally understand what we're going through as alcoholics or as drug addicts. But what we know is we just think different. We react differently. And by getting together with other people who know and understand how we feel, there's, it's just, a, it's easier to be honest. And until we're totally honest, we aren't successful with recovery overall. Um, the, the lies, right, it's, it's the darkness and the light comes through honesty, love, um, the protection of animidity, which is another big proponent, but for right now, the phone, Zoom, you can reach out to some other people, but it's just so important for me to be able to go and meet with, my, with like-minded people. If, I, if I'm a Christian, I want to go to church, right? I, I need to be around other Christians because they feed me and they help feed my soul, and it's the same thing with addiction. That's good. That's so, it's the, the way that you describe it um, that I really appreciate is it's this multi-pronged approach um, that it's not just, um, it's like you talk about Jesus being a huge part of recovery, and he is. And you talk about uh, your relationships being a huge part and your groups being a huge part, which is awesome. I love that it's, it's, it's not just one thing that's going to do it. Uh, one thing that I'm curious about and that I wonder if other people might also be curious about, is when you talk about, for, for some, faith and the way that Jesus speaks to a person or the Holy Spirit, just you speak about it so casually. Um, you know, God was speaking to me, and for some, it's like, what in the world <laughs> do you mean by that? Yeah. Um, so just, like, can you break that down into, for someone who's never experienced uh, that, that God speaking to them, they've, they've never encountered that, how would you describe that, and how can you invite somebody into that? For me, music is a big part. I'm, God touches me through song. Um, I am a big proponent to listening to Christian music, turn off the other noise. Um, for me, addiction comes from Satan. It wants to kill me. My addiction wants me dead, and it wants me separated from my belief system and my morals. Um, but it's... It's really tough to explain. When he first started speaking to me was when I first asked for help. You know, part of my road, um, my, my first marriage had ended, and that's when I started really drinking. And after being sober for a while and, and asking, I, just asking God, where were you? And the response, what I felt on my heart was, you didn't ask for help. So I'm finding that the more I ask for help, and, and some people will say, well, your higher power, um, whatever you want to call who God is to you in your heart, I believe that we are born with an innate desire and need for belonging. And that belonging for me is in fellowship and with God. And he just speaks to me in so many ways. I go for a walk and look at the birds, look at the flowers, look at how can all of these things be so glorious and beautiful without, some, without the mighty hand over it. Um, so you can find many ways that God will speak to you. A lot of times it's a friend who tells you what you really don't want to hear. And that always brings me back to remembering that iron sharpens iron. And sometimes I have to hear those tough things and... I believe that God puts those people in my life. Yeah, I like that iron sharpens iron. We think of like, oh, yeah, iron sharpens iron. But if you see iron sharpening iron, there's sparks, there's friction, there's... Uh, it's it, painful. It's, it's painful. It's intense. Well, back to the groups thing a little bit, because I know you had uh, 
we, we talked about this a little on the phone where you wanted to start a recovery group here and you were finding an interesting thing about the, the, just the way the conversation was going. So I want to invite you to address that. Yeah, it, it's really interesting because what I found is a lot of the people who were really raising their hands, we need recovery at our church, um, were people who were being affected by people who were deep in addiction. And I think that what we forget is that as badly as we want it for someone else, they have to want it themselves. But don't forget, if you have been affected, or if someone in your family members, one of your good friends is affected by addiction or deep in addiction, it affects us. I went through it not only for myself, but with people in my family who are extremely close to me. And I had to realize that I couldn't do anything for them, but I can do something for me. And it's an entire different path of recovery. Um, so I would highly encourage people, even if you've been affected, there are groups that can help you because you have unique feelings that someone who doesn't have a child or a mother or a, a sister, brother that's fighting addiction, you have feelings inside of you that somebody who hasn't experienced that cannot. Ex they can't understand. It's, I, had, I had recently said to someone, it would be like me trying to understand how a cancer patient feels. I've never fought cancer. I can empathize. I can be there to love and support, but I can't truly understand how they feel. And that's where the groups come in, and they're so important in any type of recovery. Um, they're important with life. I mean, we have other small groups at church, right, that meet. We have people who have kids. You know, the, we have a parents group. Because what they're going through as parents right now are totally different than what I went through as a parent. Totally different onset of things. We didn't have all the online stuff. So finding a unique niche and reaching out and finding there are a lot of people that I know of right here in our church that are being deeply affected by other people's addictions, and we can help one another. We can help get through that. Yeah. So uh, I'm just going to say, if, if that's you, if you're finding yourself in that situation where you're wondering, uh, who do I, who can I partner with, who can I, what's a group, just let's just make a first step of emailing us here at the church, hello at gracepeople.church, and we'll figure it out. <laughs> we'll, we'll be in conversation with Laura and figuring out what the best next step will be. Um, one last question for you, Laura, and it's been, it's been fantastic having you. Uh, your you. wisdom is apparent in this. And what word of hope can you give to those in recovery right now? Just never give up. Never stop fighting. The peace is there, and it's waiting God is waiting to just embrace you and welcome you back into his fold. Um, but the biggest thing is don't ever give up. One step forward, sometimes one step back, but then another two steps forward. Um, progress, not perfection. That's good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Hi, I'm Community of Grace Connections Coordinator Hannah Collins, here with my husband Bobby and my dog Eleanor. We're looking forward to connecting with you soon. Here are a few things we have going on. Registration for our Flying Junction Summer Mini Camps is now underway online. We are offering everything from gardening to Irish dancing. The camps begin on July 13th and meet once a week for four weeks. Check out the descriptions and pick the one that best suits your child and your schedule. We know a lot of you are wanting to help in the aftermath of the George Floyd demonstrations. We have some new opportunities with churches we are partnering with in Minneapolis and St. Paul. We will let you know more details as they are worked out. Finally, as we work our way off the map with our new sermon series, we are encouraging Community of Grace families to connect with each other and our community in meaningful ways. We have created some guidelines for what we are calling Grace Gatherings, opportunities for you to bring small groups of people to your porch or backyard to worship our great God in community. Please prayerfully consider if this is something you would like to do. You can learn more about Grace Gatherings and more anytime at gracepeople.church. Jesus makes us family. Looking forward to seeing you soon. Stay safe, community of grace.
Please join me in professing our faith together using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Just as a reminder, in about two minutes, we will be celebrating the uh, transition that has been happening uh, with a rousing rendition of Great is Thy Faithfulness. So after this service lets out, feel free to take part in that. Now please stand. Yeah, out in the commons. Now receive this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you and look upon you with favor and grant you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Please remain standing for our closing hymn. On our way rejoicing, gladly let us go. Christ our Lord, Go in peace, serve the Lord.